Hey coach, so happy you found us on YouTube. Uh, we're very excited, I'm in my happy place in, in an empty gym, but I'm in my happy place. Uh, let me know, first of all, subscribe and like, so hit the subscribe button, hit the little bell up above and you'll get notifications. We put a new video up every day to help you become a better basketball coach. Um, and if you're looking to take your coaching to the next level, come over and join us. Let me help you put a couple pictures on your wall um, at teachhoops.com. Come over and join us there and let's head back to the video. Three, two, one. All right, welcome to Coach Unplugged. Coach, you're probably going to be in the 700s by the time this thing gets posted. I think we're in the late 600s right now. All right. Um, so, yeah, so let's be good. I've done a lot of these. So I think it, I think it was 2015 is when I started doing these podcasts. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so, Bert, I'm going to have you introduce yourself. Kind of what I, what I like to have people do is kind of tell us about your basketball journey. Um, kind of where it started. You told me that a little bit before we came on air about that. And then how we got to the point where you're sitting where you are right now. And then we'll, uh, we'll dive into a couple other things after that. So I'm turning it over to you. All right. I really, my basketball journey started in the Midwest. I lived in a small town in Illinois, but it was right. It's uh, right by Terre Haute, Indiana. So I grew up on the Illinois, Indiana border. And, you know, that's such a basketball crazy world. And there's so many historic gems. And yeah. um, my first grade teacher had been uh, Steve Alford's babysitter. And so I went and watched Steve Alford play in high school. Oh, so uh, Newcastle. Newcastle. Yeah. yeah. The biggest high school gym, I think, at the time. I don't, I'm not sure if it still is. But, you know, his dad was his coach. And, you know, I was living there. French Lake wasn't too far away. And... My dad did some grad work at Indiana State when Larry Bird was there, and then he did more grad work uh, in 81 uh, when Indiana won. And so, you know, I, I was in a really good basketball environment really from the get-go. The Big Ten was really, really strong. Um, you know, Michigan was really good. Illinois was really good back then with uh, Derek Carper and, and some, some people like that from way right. back. And so – um, we moved to, we moved to California, um, for a while and I, my grandfather lived out there and his next door neighbor was the trainer for the San Diego Clippers, uh, when okay. they were still in San Diego. And so, um, you know, I got to see, I had Bill Walton lift me up in the driveway when I was a kid and, you know, I got to just see a lot of cool things and I just figured that's the way everybody grew up because I was right. so young. I, I had no idea uh, that we moved here to South Carolina and at that time the ACC was really, really good. And so those were, that was in the mid eighties. And so um, Michael Jordan had just won uh, his championship there in 82, then Balvano in 83, then Duke started coming along by 85 and 86 and, you know, Clemson is right by us, and Clemson had uh, Eldon Campbell and uh, Horace Grant and Dale Davis and a lot of good players. And so I, I just grew up in a lot of good areas for basketball. Um, so I started coaching when I was in uh, college. I started coaching uh, a middle school team, um, and then I did that all the way through college and right, right when I got out. And uh, the middle school I was at was affiliated with the same school where, where Kevin Garnett went to um, Malden. Okay. And so yep. just being around Kevin Garnett, you know, he's – we're watching the last dance right now and seeing how competitive Michael Jordan is. And, you know, anybody in the NBA will tell you that Kevin Garnett's the only one that ri really rivals Michael Jordan. They, they even put him over Kobe Bryant for the kind of uh, competitiveness that he, that he brought. And it was – cool to be around that um so I, I i did that and then i i got my first high school job in washington dc uh then i came back here to south carolina to malden high school coach for a little while i got to start a program in atlanta and uh by year three we made our first final four we made five final fours in a row and during that stretch i won three straight state championships um, and then through that, I got this job in college. So that's kind of a fairly quick overview of how I got to where I'm and at. Tell people where you are right now. I'm in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, you know, Zion Williamson was from right around this area. And uh, in fact, he had to play a couple of games at our 
at our facility because he blew up so much his much. senior year. We came, we played in a tournament down there. Is there, is there like Dunham or St. Uh, yeah, Dorman. Yeah. State, Dorman, uh, State Farm. Yeah. Class. Yeah. That, that gym's huge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's like that's arena. Right yeah. That's, that's better than a lot of college gyms. It is. And it's, I, I, I swear they had like a Chick-fil-A inside their cafeteria. Like, yeah, they do. They it's do. like, how does that work? <laughs> my guys are looking at me like, what are you? And then we went, okay, so you're going to remind me because there was a place where we went to get seafood. Oh, man. You know what I'm talking about? And it, it had yeah. hot, uh, and it was kind of, you lined up and you got the food and they pounded it into a big. Yeah. Oh, I don't remember the name of it. The um, Beacon. Huh? The Beacon. The Beacon. Yep. Yeah, and the boys started they had like contests on hot sauce. That was not a good idea. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Luckily, no. it was the between games, I think. But oh, the food was really good. I mean, they they mounted it on top of, of yeah. the beacon. I do remember it was the it's beacon. Bad for your arteries, but good for your good for your palate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good for your wallet too, because it was it was right. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So let's uh let's let's have you share your screen. Let's talk two two one first. Okay. And do you run the do you run the two two one? So where I'm at now, this is my my third year at the college uh, level here, and I'm just this this year is my first year where I was able to uh, start to have some guys that could press, and so I I was almost 100% divided. I had five seniors and six freshmen, and okay. <laughs> so. And tell me about the school. Tell me a little bit about Bob Jones. Um, private Christian school. Okay. Uh, the, the sports program is pretty new. Uh, we are we are considered provisional D three because it's a couple year process. But you know we're, we're we're to the point where you can we can have the logos on the floor and we can you know we compete against other D three, but we're not eligible for postseason play yet or anything like that. And so we're. In this part of the country, it's not like where you're at. Uh, we're the only D3 in South Carolina. So, no. So the rest are – there's a lot of D2s and NAI schools around, but we're the only D3. So all of our games will, will be out of state when that happens. So and what, That's crazy. Like, Wisconsin doesn't have any D2s. <laughs> right. Right. Wisconsin has zero D twos. No, no, that, that's wrong. Parkside's a D two. They have one. They have one D two, um, but Minnesota has tons of them. Yeah, that's yeah. funny. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. How NAIA in Division two is more than than D three. Yeah, like the the WEAC could almost be D two in our. Uh, they're so good. The WEAC's very good. Like with yeah. Oshkosh. And, I mean, you think of all the good coaches that have come out of Wisconsin D three. Right. You know, <laughs> right. Bruce Dick Pearl. Bennett, you know, yeah. Bo Ryan, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. Right. Okay, so uh, the two two one. So let's talk about the two two one and the stunt. So you go ahead. I'll just I'll be quiet and you go ahead and talk. Okay. You know, uh, my philosophy for my team is to have a player led team, and I think that. You know, hopefully we have a chance to talk about program building a little bit later, but I think, you know, everything you do is based on your philosophy. And I don't think that you can have a player led team in one respect, but then not let them lead in another respect. And so the way we play our offense, which is if you were to look at it, you would say it's dribble drive, but it's really like the next, the next version of, of dribble drive uh, where there's a lot more passing and, and quick movement. And then I think with defense, it's the same thing. Um, I think especially with pressing, you can teach your guys to read situations. And I call it our motion defense. And, you know, you want to take yourself out of the equation as much as possible. Basketball doesn't lend itself to a lot of stoppages and, and correcting like a lot of coaches like to do in practice. And so, you know, if you're going to have this philosophy – then you need to run your practices that way. And right. you, need to, you need to let your players lead the practice. My, my players lead the first almost 30 minutes of practice without us saying anything. 
and they just know what to do and they get after it. And is that and, the same, is that the same for every practice or does that change? Uh, almost every practice. Um, you know, sometimes it might, I mean, the later you get in the year, um, the more you don't really need to do that, but I want them, you know, coaches talk about, man, we, we keep getting off to a slow start. And I think the way you practice every day affects how you, how you play on game day. And so, you know, we, we do 10 minute jump rope before we get on the court and then we get on the court and they, they get right into a pressing game or a special situation, whatever we've dictated for that day. And, you know, we don't stop anything during that time. We just film it and, and we address it later. But I, I feel like since we can't stop it during a game and fix it, we can't stop it during practice and fix it. And right. obviously we do in, in the first week or two, but uh, as we get going, I want them to jump rope and then get right to playing. And then, you know, during that first water break, we do some dynamic stretching and we do some talking about what we just did practice wise. But I feel like getting right into it, if you're going to be a pressing team and a player led team, I feel like that starts with when they walk on the floor, you can't get them together, have a little huddle, go through dynamic stretching, do some shooting drills, and then expect to play awesome from the get go when the, when, in a game situation. I just don't think those two things are congruent. So right. everything stems from our philosophy. Um, you know, I sent you this. If anybody yep. wants this, you can. Yep. I'll put it in the show notes too. When it okay. goes out, I'll put it in the show notes so people. Can... I am. Uh, I'm creating a a course uh, to explain some of this and have some video of this on Coach Tube. Okay. So if you know, if you or anybody wants to look at that, I'm not done with it yet. But okay. Um. Break the other team's practice habits. I mean, I learned that from Morgan Wooten when I first started coaching. You know, it, it all comes down to that. And all of us know the personalities of the coaches in our league and most of the people that we play. And you know what you need to take away right now before you ever go into the season next year. Most of us, if we're doing our job, should know our opponents well enough where you know what it looks like in your practice to take away the other team's practice habits. And so all the things that are in this press, you could never do all in one year. Right. But if you if you pick some things that, you know, you know your league well enough to do, you know, you can really mess with some people and break their practice habits if you pick the right things that fit your guys and fit what you're trying to take away from your opponent. Um, you know, it helps your defense be more aggressive and communicate. I teach my press before I teach my half-court shell. I just feel like my shell goes so much quicker and there's so much more – tuned into it when I've already taught my press first. Because it's so, an easier sell probably, right? right? They all want to press and run, yeah. And so all I'm trying to do is build their mentality for the first couple of weeks. And part of building that mentality, um, you know, I'm not to the point where I'm at right now where we have enough, where we've had enough um, games built up to do this. But at high school, you know, I would have – how many times we held somebody to under 50 points or how many times, you know, we beat somebody by whatever, whatever my goals were. And I posted that, you know, at the, at the baseline on the court, on the wall there. And so the opponents had to see that we just held our last four teams to 46 points or something like that. And, you know, it was all about just building, you know, what was important to us and building that pressing, pressing habit. And, it's more a mentality than anything. And, you know, you can teach half court defense pretty quickly. I think if you've taught the full court defense well, and so number eight down there, my half court goal, or really my defensive goal is to make them cross half court on the outer third. Uh, so cross by the sideline there. And when you do that, that helps everybody establish their ball side and weak side early. Um, and, and, you know, at my level, you're, you have a, a shot clock and uh, it really, t we're really trying to get people to use a lot of time out of their shot clock before they ever get into anything. Yeah. And the thing is what I tell um, for people listening to what I say is you basically want them outside the volleyball lines. Cause most high schools have volleyball lines. Right. So if you get them outside the volleyball lines, you're good. Um, Cause most high school courts have a volleyball line and that outer third is 
outside the volleyball line. But and so when it's on the outer third, I want everybody on my team to be on on that half of the court and just make it always look super crowded. And the only thing that should ever look remotely open is something, you know, 50 feet away. Right. And if that pass is able to be made, whether we're in a full court press or no matter what we're doing, if that pass is able to be made, there's no other there's no other problem than the fact that there wasn't enough ball pressure. It's an easy thing to to know whose fault it was. And, you know, it's just like pressuring the quarterback. If the quarterback can see down the field, he's going to pick you apart all day. Right. And you've just got to make that, that other team's point guard into the best dribbler ever and not let him – pass through your whatever defense you're you're trying to apply um i choose the 2-2-1 alignment i i i did a, a call earlier today with a high school program in texas and you know what i'm not able to really show when i do this presentation but i, I like to talk about is andy landers was the women's coach at georgia and he's got lots of notes that are out there he's got videos that are out there and all that but teaching how he teaches man-to-man -man defense is really where I start. He's okay. got a guy on the ball, and then uh, the two defenders that are behind the on-ball defender, they're staggering that on-ball defender's shoulders. So the guy, the ball handler is always looking at the fact that he, if, if he dribbles left or he dribbles right, he's going to run into a defender. And when you teach that alignment that way, I think it's really easy to teach any press uh, once you've taught where the def off ball defenders need to be in relationship to the ball okay. and, and how you rotate for that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the two, two, one alignment, you know, I've coached from middle school up to college now, and I just think the, the two, two, one alignment is the easiest thing to teach. It gives you the most flexibility for things that you want to do. And I think that you can use it, whether you have, whether you're coaching girls, uh, whether you're coaching unathletic guys, uh, whatever, for me, the two to one alignment, if I teach that, I can teach any of the stunts that go with it, I think pretty quickly. Have you found that if, let's say I'm not as good as you, can I run it against you? If you're better than me, can I run the two to one against you? Um, like you're more athletic, you got better dribblers. Can I, and I'm not quite as athletic, can I run it against you? Yes. Okay. You know, you, your pickup point may be different. Um, you see here what I have there on number four. Right. I, I like to put, if I have, if you have unathletic guys, most, most of the time they're probably going to be your bigger guys. And right. if they're playing. And I don't mind putting them up front, front because they make good, it's hard to pass out of a trap that a big guy does if he's able to set it. But if he gets beat or, you know, if he sets a halfway decent trap, if you're if you have two unathletic guys up front, then you have three athletic guys that are good at reading things and they can cover a lot of ground and erase a lot of mistakes. You know, I would rather my big guys get beat 94 feet away from the basket and then have my three, you know, most athletic, quickest guys be able to get back and, and hold the lane if it came to that or, or be back there for my interceptors. And so I like you know, that idea. I like that idea. One of the things we do is we two to one press off of every free throw and so whoever whoever is shooting the free throw is the front left of the two to one press he just knows that he's going to drop back so whether we make or miss it if you think about where a two to one picks up you know that person has to take maybe two or three steps and so make or miss we know that we're right in a press uh, off of a free throw and it's just, do you run do you run your two to one on misses uh, I have before. Uh, there was a coach uh, out of Louisville, sent a lot of people to play for Patino, both at Kentucky and Louisville. And I went and spent time with him. And I mean, you've really got to spend a lot of time doing it if you're going to be a team that does it. But I had a team that did it. And one of my teams that went all the way to the championship, you know, we just had a bunch of quick guys. We had nobody big. And that was the only way we were going to do anything. Do and, and so I have done it. Uh, but it, it takes a lot of time to do it. It takes most right. of your practice time if you're going to be effective. Yeah, you got to practice it a lot. That's what I have found, too. Yeah. yeah. But it's fun if you have – once you get to the point where the guys can do it, 
it's really, really fun to do. Yeah, if you have a bunch of guards, I have found it to be more effective too. It's like, you, and, the, and they're interchangeable in some respects. Right. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions here? You want nope, to keep that's good. Motion, okay. nope, we can keep going. Uh, just some thoughts with pressing. Don't get beat the same way twice. And, <laughs> you know, you can... I do that on defense. I do that on everything. There's, you should yeah. never, you should never, I, I do it as you should never make the same mistake twice. Right. Like if you're not, if you're not hedging on this, don't get beat. I mean, I give you one mistake, but you shouldn't do the same mistake twice. I do that. I talk about that all the time on both ends of the court, but yeah. Right. That's good. Yeah. If, you know, and so when it comes to scripting practice, you know, I've had two assistants and I've had, you know, one B for the next game and then the other assistant be in charge of the scout for the game after that. And, you know, getting a good idea of what the other team wants to do against our press. And so, you know, you are going to get beat. That's why you have to have some change up and some different looks and what I call stunts. And your team has to get to the point where they know which stunt will take away whatever just beat them. And, you know, you're not talking about 20 different possible things. There's only a really a couple things that people can do, whether it's bringing four people all the way up to the ball or a one, three, one set, whatever. And if you practice those all the time, your guys will just get used to recognizing it. And, you know, through film and through practice, they can get, they can understand what, what stunt they need to do. And you don't need to call a timeout to fix it. And if you get your team to that point, you know, they that that really frustrates the other team a lot when your team is making changes on the fly and they don't need you to do it and it sounds like it's difficult if you've never done it but i would i would challenge you to try it if you haven't and just see see how your guys respond um short memory if you do get scored on i hate it when we get scored on and we walk and let them get set up if you get scored on Obviously, if they just scored on you. And hey, coach, hope you're enjoying the video. A um, couple things. Make sure you subscribe and like. That's the first thing. Leave some comments down below. Second thing is, if you want me to help you fill up your showcase just like this one, go over and check out teachhoops.com for coaches who want to get better. 14-day free trial. Hopefully not too many of those silver ones. Uh, let's head back to the video. They were breaking your press. They're all, they're all right there by the basket. And so... You know, getting a guy who can inbound it and throw it long like Kevin Love, you know, right. that, that is really deflating for them to score and then us be scoring within, you know, three to five seconds. And I've had teams be, be really good at that. So, in effect, yes, you just scored on us, but we're, we're back up the same point margin we just were within three to five seconds. So, congratulations to you for scoring. But right. It really didn't do a whole lot to hurt us. The wash, yes. Right. Number three, you know, you don't get beat because of the type of defense you're playing. You get beat because of how you were playing that defense. And, you know, you'll get fans or administrators, parents saying, coach, they just beat you twice with layups. You need to get out of the press. Well, we don't, we don't get out of half court, two, three zone or man right. to man when somebody scores on us twice. It's, it's not the defense we're playing. It's how we're playing that. And, right. you know, maybe we're the only ones in the entire arena that knows that. But, you know, if you got to do it, you can't listen to what people in the stand say. They've got no idea what they're talking about. And if you have a pressing philosophy, you know, in my opinion, you need to have it long term. It can't be something you get out of. You know, if, if we had six or eight points scored on us, that's the point that I would call a timeout. But that that is very rare for that to happen where I've got six or eight unanswered points. Um, so like I say there, number four, you can't be half pregnant. And because you can't be half pregnant, I don't think you can be a halfway pressing team. And then if it doesn't work for a little while, then you go to something else. I really feel like if you want to be a pressing team, your players know whether you're doing it halfway or whether you're all sold out to it. And I think they'll be sold out if you're sold out to it. Right. Um, any press is more effective if you make them cross half court on the left-hand side. Uh, I found that to be really effective on the high school level. You know, if you think about how a lot of 2-2-1 presses are beat, especially the ball goes into the inbounders right, 
it comes back to the end bounder, then it's kicked over to the left hand side. And that's exactly what I want them to do. And so a couple of these stunts that I have here are really just to make that happen. I don't care if they get it in and I don't care if they go back. I want them to go to the left. And then somebody who's not used to dribbling really quickly down the left hand sideline with his left hand, um, you know, when the time's running, the 10 second clock's running down, all of that. I really feel like that's an undervalued part of pressing that, that people don't spend a lot of time on. But when I've had a lot of success, it's, it's because uh, a majority of the possessions they've had to cross half court on the left-hand side. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Um, every alignment, no matter what press you're doing, everybody, every alignment has two trappers, two interceptors, and one basket protector. And, you know, yeah, it doesn't matter if you're running the one, two, two either. I mean, it's, right. a, it's the same. Yeah. you Anything yeah. you do. And so if you think about that, you're always going from one job to the, to another, you're never just a trapper and a press. If you're a trapper, you're quickly going from being a trapper to being an interceptor. And so the reason I, I, I talk about that is sometimes people think when it's passed out of the trap, my job's done. Now it's up to the rest of my team. And it's, Nothing could be further from the truth. You know, as soon as it's passed out, you get your nose back in front of the ball because you're, you're, you are the next interceptor. Somebody else is about to be the next trapper. So going from one job to the other is something we practice a lot. And again, that might be undervalued. A lot of people value, you know, shifts or angles or different things like that. But I think what I just said before, crossing on the left-hand side and then going from one job to another, I think those two things have helped even my unathletic teams be able to, to press really well. And that, um, that takes practice. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. Um, nothing easy is worth it. Nothing worth it is easy. So I, I feel like that's what it is when, when it comes to defense, you know. I agree. Um, Trappers, L trap, uh, the L trap is made by the shape of your two trappers. And so the person, there's always in a trap, there's a person who's stopping the forward progress. And then there's somebody that's coming in from the side to close the, I call closing the jail cell, closing the door there. Okay. And that, that person's job is to bring his foot and straddle the other person's foot. So it looks like an L if you were looking at it from a, from an aerial view. Okay. I have them cross arms, and so above their head, it looks like an X. And I do that for a couple of reasons. You mean, what do you mean cross, like, I'm not sure, I'm not yeah. sure I understand what you mean by cross <laughs> arms. Uh, let me stop share for a second. Okay. Uh, I have them do that. So that's, the, the guy that's trapping does this. Both yeah. of them do this. The two guys that are in the trap, if you think about it, it's hard to pass through that if you just pick the ball up. And it's hard for your guys to commit a stupid reach-in foul. So they're both doing this with their hands. Right. Okay. So there's, so, not, so there's not space on the side? I, I would throw well, it over your armpit. Well, if they go down below, how, how much distance are they going to get on that pass? You know? Yeah, I agree. Because so okay. my theory here, is always you want to break the, the windows. You know, there's a window right, above an ear, right. window above an ear, hips. And above so the I, head yeah i agree so and so i take i take the most dangerous window away because you I take don't four think you, you take three of the windows away right. above the head and both both ears yeah right. and i feel like i don't feel like in any defense you could stop everything and so i stop the what hurts us that pass over us that's long hurts us if you're in a trap and somebody tries to make a close pass you know that's not going to hurt us and so that's why I, like, I do that. So you're basically saying you got to pass downward, which is going right. to slow. I like that. I've never thought yeah. of that. And yeah, most right, of the time, most of the time, it's a, it's a bounce pass, and which is fine because that gives right. me time to recover. I love that. Okay. Right. Bounce passes don't hurt you. So no. Okay. You want them to to pass around you, but never through you. And so I don't I don't mind if they do that. Well, and you know what I love, Coach, that you just said too is. I tell them 95% of the time, you, I don't want you to steal the ball. I want the guys when That's, I want to steal on right. the pass. Right. High school kids want to like reach and do all. It's like, oh my, ooh. <laughs> it's like no hair, you know, kind of thing. Oh my gosh. Yes. Right. Okay. 
um, interceptors. And so that you've got your two trappers. We just talked about them. And my last point there is what you just said, don't steal. It's never the trapper's job to steal. Their job is to trap. That's, that's the name of their job. Right. Um, interceptors job is to intercept. And so just like you read a quarterback shoulders, if a quarterback shoulders are facing down, if he's a right-handed quarterback and he's looking down the right sideline, you know, he's not going to throw it to the left sideline, you know, by his shoulders where he's going to pass. And so interceptors are constantly asking themselves the question, what is the most likely pass? And then Don Meyer used to talk about the Doric press at the ball get a lot of times, especially in high school, a big guy will inbound it because they don't want the big guy in there uh, receiving it against the press. And if a team gets it back to their dork, I'll lay everybody else off and I'll let that dork bring the ball up the court. We'll, we'll try to deny everybody else. I so, love that. So then, so you just go man then at that point. Yeah. And, and I don't even have anybody on him. I, I have my, whoever his defender is just trying to look for where his most likely pass is. And if you think about it, every team probably has one. You, we all have a guy who it would kill us if he was the guy bringing the ball up, the, up to right. press every time. So, right, and that goes into your scout. Like, we, if this guy catches it, fold enough. I love that. Yeah. Right. And so that may not be politically correct, so you may need to come up with a, <laughs> another Yeah, I'm thing. not sure Doric. I'm not sure where <laughs> Doric would be. That's, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but Don Meyer wasn't politically correct. So no, okay. he was not. But he was he was a innovator. Let me tell you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I got to spend some time with him before before he passed. I was fortunate enough to to be a part of his coaching clinics and his coaching school that he used. To I know. Have. I uh, I always he always used to hand out all these colored things, and I still yeah. find them every once in a while. You know, it's like I'm well, cleaning stuff out and he's still got he's got a website with all of his handouts on it it's, oh, he does. it's awesome yeah oh yeah um so do you want me to go through these uh, sure yeah just go through here? these i want to see the stunts too so this is good yeah okay base press um you know i i do my shifts out of a two two one a little bit differently uh yukon when uh, calhoun was there the way that they did it is the way that that I, I shift now and who I trap with, but it's not always the way that I do it. It just fit my person all this year. And I've got some diagrams here while I'll okay. show what I mean. Up is when, you know, we have one syllable words for everything that we do. I don't think your guys can handle two syllable words. So everything we do is just one, one command. It's like a dog, a dog's right. can, dogs can only hear one syllable. So that's, that's spot. Right. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah. So, up or down. I love that. Up is our aggressive, and we can trap anywhere. Uh, I prefer most of the time to trap after half court if I'm in a zone trap, uh, just because I don't like him to be able to go backwards, and right. that gives people a lot of problems with a shot clock. Um, but that's that's where I'm at now. Down, down is where we're closer to our basket. We're defending. It's it's really just to take time. I'm trying to force that ball reversal that I talked about. Um, I use it with the freak defense. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I am. you know, you do so many passes uh, where you're in a two, three zone and then whatever number you give it uh, after that third or fourth pass, you're into man to man. And so we do that a lot and that takes up a lot of clock. We do that when we play against D one teams and, it doesn't matter if they know that it's coming. It just, it does take time. And if I can get D1's teams to be, you know, shooting in the last uh, eight or nine seconds of their clock, you know, the more times I do that, the better. And that's helped us stay close against, you know, really superior opponents. Okay. Uh, go is our run and jump, which I can do out of man. I can do out of a 2-2-1, two, two, whatever. Um, and I could do it out of my 2-1-2 two, two alignment. The number is just what I was talking about with the freak defense. After whatever number of passes, we go to man. Uh, so we go from down into man after, say, two to three passes. Uh, and uh, so here's up, just really aggressive. Uh, I bring – so I bring – in UConn, I bring the three to trap, X1 and X3 on the sideline there. Okay. Um, but, you know – 
most of the time I like X1 and X2 to be my trappers and the 221, but but this year I didn't do it that way. Right. So then how do you stop like one how do you stop one just getting the momentum and not throwing it over to two then on the sideline? Um you know if you were able to see what I start off with, a, with a Andy Lander stuff and how I teach the man-to-man -man defense, you know, he's just – X3 is stunting a lot. He's okay. coming up like he's about to trap, and then he's running back down the sideline. Okay. He's like and, fake trapping, yeah. Right. And so X3, he's the one that says now. And when he says now, everybody on the court knows that he's going to trap. I don't care if the ball handler knows it. In fact, I prefer that he knows it. Right. So when, when X1, let's say he gets up to that hash mark and he sees that X3 is about to trap him, you know, he wants to get rid of it and throw it to that too. And X5 takes that away. Okay. Uh, that's just our, our basic uh, aggressive. Again, down is just, you know, we see we're picking up at the top of the three-point circle. We're looking for ball reversals. We're not really looking to do anything. I do this a lot when we're ahead in the second half, and I just want them to, without fouling or anything, without putting my team in a chance to, you know, keep the clock stopped. I want that clock to keep going, and so we just use this as our slowdown offense. Our so the opposite, the opposite guard in that last one is basically taking the middle away. Right. Like sinking in that middle and taking away the five or whoever. That's a one-three-one break. Yeah, breaking right. it with a one-three-one. Okay. Um go that's the run and jump and so you know you're you're in Forrest Larson area and Eddie Andrist uh two guys that have done this really really well and anything I've got from the run and jump I've got from those two Wisconsin guys right. but you know x3 comes and traps when the ball handler when he sees the back of the ball handler's head when the ball handler can't see him coming um and then everybody is on a on a clock basically when they see when x3 yells go um everybody knows we're in the running running trap actually. so what's x1 x1's trying to keep the the one's trying to keep him on the sideline right and then he jumps up ahead and, and stops his forward progress to get the guy to turn and when the guy goes to turn with his left hand x3 has shut the door there and so if we can get that turn and he goes to turn back to the middle of the court to pack it pass it back to x4 and he's you know, he's going from his right hand, trying to pass with his left hand. That's where crossing your arms really, really helps. I mean, what kind of pass is he going to make, Right. you know, from right there? If everybody rotates like they're supposed to, you see that three over here is the only one that's open. And if they're crossing their arms and they're applying ball pressure, there's no way that one is going to be able to pass to three. Right. What I tell my players too, is like, if you get that trap there on that elbow extended, there's only three places that it, we need to pay, take the three passing lanes away. The right. one down the sideline, the one in the middle and the one back the long one. Okay. Well, if we're getting a good enough trap, they're not going to see that. Um, right. Yeah. So and it's again, always, yeah, that's why you trap on the side. It again, I have them going, you know, to the ball handlers right. But if you can get them going left and, and doing this, you know, which you can over the course of a game, um, you know, it's even more effective. Now here's my stunts. Um, I've got a couple different ways that I have stunted. And so this first way was really helpful for me when I was in high school. Uh, I've I coached a girls team for only one year and we won a championship doing this type of stuff. Right. Um, but I got tired of them missing practice for horseback riding lessons and ballet lessons and all that. So uh, <laughs> I was not like my neighbors. I could, I could not stick with it. It, it drove me crazy. <laughs> well, he, uh, yeah, but, he's a, he's brilliant. Okay. So I call it mom uh, stands for just moving one man. And I just have my X3 change between uh, – he's on the front of the 1-2-2 two, two press. He's in the middle of my 2-1-2 two, two press, and he's at the back of my 2-2-1. Two, two, and so the box portion of all three of those zone presses, their responsibilities basically stay the same. And when you're at a high school level, you know, coaching girls, middle school level, whatever, um, you know, simplicity – Sometimes there's genius and simplicity. Well, and the thing is, those all look different for the coaches. They do. They do. But it, it, you can do this 
with very little practice time, you just teach the box their responsibilities. And so here I have the, the diagram, X3 is up there on the front. You know, it's gotta be your most versatile player. You know, if you're, you probably don't want somebody 5'10", but if they could be over six feet, you know, they can effectively run, I think all three spots of this, you know, at, at the right. high school male level. Yep. Um, middle of the two one two. And who do you and have? Then, who do you have trapped? Go back to the two two one two. Who traps on the two one two? The one in the three. Well, I'm going to show you that here. Okay. So I use I use a lot of my two two one to to really set up my my two one two. Okay. Uh, so that's the back of the two two one. And if you're if you want to do that group of stunts, I think just doing that for a lot of people can can really create problems for for your opponent. So like I said at the outset, I don't think doing all of these in one season is feasible for anybody at any level. I've just put together a package of things. But you do you think a high school team could do these three stunts? Yeah, oh yeah. 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 Okay. Easily. Cuz I think this would freak I I think that would freak a lot of high school teams out. Because yeah. it's basically three – they, they think you're running three different presses. And, you know, one of the things I did when I coached high school was, you know, we would um, – so this is an odd front. So if the score on the scoreboard was odd, we would run this. And right. if it was even, we would run a 2-2-1. Two, two, and, you know, let's say if it was a zero or a five, if it got to one of those scores, we would run a 2-1-2. Two, one, two. Two. And so whatever I did that year, whatever year it was, you know, those, those kids would know. And so I just gave them an easy way to change without me having to call timeouts or yell it from the sidelines. So, you know, that's really hard to pick up on scouting when, when somebody is changing their press and why, right. you know, they're not going to know when they're looking on film, they're not going to know that you changed it according to what was on the scoreboard. So that was just one way I thought of, um i've I like also that. held up oh yeah i mean it also depends on the type of team you have for the listeners right. like, i've had teams yeah. that i've been able to do you know make misses i've been able to do left side right side but you got to be like they got to be they got to be thinking the game i yeah that, that it really depends on your team i think yeah you're you're absolutely correct on that and i've, I've laminated uh stuff and just held laminated signs like football coaches do yeah on the sideline and you know if you look at this right here it's just an x and so you just have an x there and a box if you want a 221 or you know something like that and it's it's easy right all right so so these are some of the these are some of the fun ones that are that you get to do out of a 212 alignment gone if you've already been doing a 221 um and now you have X3 come and, come and be the trapper. X1 and X3 are the trapper. Um, X3 gives the now call. X4 is now taking that sideline fast, where in the previous, in the 2-2-1, two, two, it was right. X5 taking it. And so that's just a simple look, as you can see in the second diagram. But, you know, when you're not expecting, when you're expecting that trap to come from X4 and it's not, you know, that that's – that's one simple change up. I like and that. Just, you know, it just messes with them. I really like this one flash. And with all of these, I put why, why I would change to this during a game or why I would do this. So in this one, X4 does flash up. X3, if you're looking at that ball handler, that ball handler doesn't see X3 coming down the sideline. So as he's making that pass, two is going to look really, really open. And if you have that good X3 there, that that really messes with people when they never know who the trapper or the interceptor is going to be. Right. And yeah. so that's why I put X3 slide. It's not a normal rotation as a silent interceptor. And so if a coach were going to – if your opponent were going to try to go against this stuff in practice, you would force them to eat up a ton of practice time to be able to handle all this stuff. And so I go back to – all of this is just geared on breaking the other team's practice habits. And, right. you know, it's not really that difficult to learn if these are the stunts you choose. You know, Morgan Wooten, just the basic, 
instead of X4 guarding the end bounder, he's just playing center field and the other two guys are in denial and he's really just looking for anything over the top. Uh, why would I use that? I just use that when we're behind or when I really just want to speed up the game, even yeah. if, we're, if we're not behind. If I feel like it's not at the pace that I want to play and people are really trying to slow us down, then I might put this in for a couple possessions. Um, and these are some other good ones. When I talk about remote control and getting people to, to inbound it and then do what I want to do, uh, these are the things that I do that look like one thing when they start. It always looks like a one, two, one, one, and then it gets into my two, two, one or two, one, two. And they're, it's super easy. You know, you could teach these in one day at practice. Um, and I have all the whys here. Let's look at the read first. Read is just looks like a basic one, two, one, one press. And once the ball goes in, you know, I usually do this at the beginning of the game if I'm not that familiar with my opponent or they haven't faced much pressing when I played them. And so I don't have a whole lot of film on, on what they're going to try to do against the press. I'll just throw that out there and see what they like to do, who their ball handlers are, are and all that. And once the ball's in, I may stay just stay in straight man to man or I might go to a normal one, two, one, one zone press and just show a trap or two. And none of that is my intention. It's really just to figure out some things about their team and make them think that that's what I'm going into. Um, so that sets up stay. Uh, stay, X4 doesn't, the inbound defender doesn't allow the ball to be passed back to four. Why would I use that? Either four is really good or one is really bad. And if I don't want the ball to go back to four, I'll make one, you know, I'll make one be the one that brings it up. And if, uh, you know, four is really good, same thing. I don't want him to, to constantly beat us. So none of these are things that you can stay with for an entire game. But it goes back to never let them beat you the same way twice. And if, if passing back to four uh, has toast, you know, has, has toasted you, you know, take that away and make one who's uncomfortable bringing it up according to what his coach has been telling him in practice, make him bring it up against pressure. Um, I, like I write here, I often use it in the second half or after a dead ball situation where, because uh, sometimes I want to put the right people in place. And so, um, or I don't want to coach at halftime to be able to show them some answers against it. So I tend to use it in the second half or they'll have to burn a timeout if they want to do something against it. Uh, squeeze, uh, we want to make four look open. And when, when four looks open, X3 is coming from the blind side to steal that inbound pass. Um, like you and I were talking about, you know, we take away the, most, the three most logical passes right there. And so now you've got – And a high school kids really want to pass it back and reverse right. it. They, they really do. do. And so, you know, everything, again, these are all really simple things, and it's not even a one two one one trap. It's showing that, but, but it's not really what it is. You're, you're, you're really just stunting by showing that, one, that read, that one two one one first, and that, all that read is doing is setting up these different things – um, to be able to, to mess with them a little bit. And I love having more timeouts than the other coach at the end of the game. I love seeing <laughs> him yelling at his players and, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, these two right here, these last two stunts that are more out of a 2 2 one set, um, or they, they go back into a 2 to one Again, they look like they're out of a 1-2-1-1. One, one, one. Uh, but bump. The inbound defender just simply comes back. He looks like he's in a one-two-one-one. It gets into one right there. And you're, you're right into a two-two-one two, two, one press, and then uh, slide. Same thing, except your two slides back. Your your inbound defender comes up and gets the ball, and really that just messes with people. They they wonder what you're doing. Um, they tend to try to reverse it, and if I see that they're going to keep reversing it, then I go back to that squeeze play. And we look to take that away. And so really it's just dance steps. It's nothing that's too intricate. I've just, 
you know, I, I give credit in all these slides and at the end of this presentation to, you know, none of this stuff is really original with me. The only thing I think I've This is what I was going to ask you too, this, the drill stuff. How much, how much time do you spend on specific press in practice? And then how much do you drill it like this? Uh, this can you explain, go, go through those drills real quick. Okay. Just briefly explain those. Um, cut off the sideline drill, you know, cutting off the sideline, this leads into our, our best trapping drill. So this is one defender against two offenders. Um, as soon as he gets it in, he's got to cut that guy off. The ball goes back to the inbounder and that inbounder has to try to get up. We've got cones placed along there. And okay. that inbounder has to try to get up to that cone. And that defender has to leave where he just was was at, which simulates going out of a trap. Uh, and he's got to run up and he's got to be a trapper on the other side. So he's got to get his nose up ahead of the ball. He can't buddy run. He's just got to pick out the angle on the court where that guy's going to get to. And so because we've got a cone up there uh, somewhere, you know, around this level, you know, he – this guy, he knows this guy's not going to screw up the drill and start dribbling back towards the middle of the court. That's not the idea. He's just trying to get here before the defender does. And so if we do that, they've got to do it four times. Um, you know, one, two, three, four. They've got to be able to do that. And, and you want uh, him to get in front of the dribbler, like right, to so, cut him off. Yeah, yes. this guy's job is to straddle the sideline uh, because you can step out of bounds. The offensive guy can't. And so when we added our trapper to that, they're constantly going from being the two that are in the, the guys that are in the trap uh, to the guys sprinting out of the trap and uh, coming together to bring that, that L together. And so to me, it's the best trapping drill I do. You know, it, it's tiring, but the guys really like it because I make it competitive, uh, you know, blue against white and um you know we scored at the end and so hey coach hope you're enjoying the video make sure you subscribe and like make sure you hit the bell up above we love those um if you're looking to take your coaching to the next level let me help you do that at teachhoops.com for coaches who want to get better let me let you fill out your showcase with state championships or not too many of those silver ones i hope uh go over and check it out teachhoops.com for coaches who want to get better let's head off to the to the um video It'll be all blue going against all white for 10 possessions. And then we'll, we'll flip it around. And, um, you know, they really take pride in it. And it teaches them to communicate because the two trappers basically are, are like two people trying to herd a, a sheep. Right. And, and <laughs> right. so you can't do that if you're silent out in a huge field somewhere. If two, if two cowboys were trying to herd sheep, they would, they would communicate they would actually bring their arms together and kind of scoot that guy towards the sideline. And so it really builds the, the now call, the L trap, uh, shutting the door, the last guy, you know, when the first guy stops forward progress, the other guy comes and he slams the door shut. And so it, it really works on doing that. Uh, it's way better than, you know, if you look at it, it looks like the old fashioned zigzag drill, but it's way better than the zigzag drill. I love that. Uh, UConn, you know, I just break down. Uh, I start with the two positions. And so this is how we rotated this year. And so I just break down the responsibilities, you know, when to stunt, how to fake, where we want to trap right there across half court. I break down all of that. And then I just, I have, I have X1, take X4's position. X4 goes off the court. And everybody that comes in has to play all the positions as I'm teaching it, even if I, I don't end up doing it throughout the year. As I'm putting it in, I want them to know what everybody's supposed to do because you never know if they're going to have to do it in a game. Right. And so then we built that up with a third man. You know, if you, if you choose this as your rotation, that five man's got to take away the sideline pass. And so – you know, my rotation would be one takes four spot, four takes five spot, five steps off the court. And, you know, again, you see in my notes there, they learn when to say now, uh, how to take it away. All the communication that we as coaches say is most important. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, t I'm telling them what to say, 
and when to say it, what they're looking at to know when to make that call. Right. Don't assume they can do it. That's what I tell the young coaches. Right. If you don't tell them what to do, don't assume any. It's like, it's like, why aren't they leading? Well, it's because they don't know how to lead. You have to teach them how to lead. Like it's the same thing with talking. And so these are some of the things that we're doing in that first 20 minutes where I say it's player led, you know, once they know how to do it, then we do all of this 25% speed and we over communicate. I always tell them to say what you see. And so if they're all saying what they see, you know, five on this screen right here, he's seeing four and one, he's gonna have the best view to say what he sees. And so those people in the back should really over communicate. And if you do it slow, it'll help them when it's fast, but you can't, you can't have them do it when you're going full speed. If they've never communicated well before, they can't do it when they're going full speed. They're trying to remember too much. So I think you have to teach it slow. And then I think that actually helps them get it quicker when you teach it slow at first. Um, so you see when we have a four man rotation, how we go through that. Um, Wolf, you know, I do this from all different angles on the court. I show this in the middle, but I start the two defenders at the blocks, uh, the offensive guy at the free throw line. Uh, and I have him dribble on whatever hand he dribbles with. I have him stay with that hand because I feel like that's more game like he can't keep switching back and forth between his right and left hand. That's not the way it would happen in a game against the press. And so, right. you know, I'm teaching those defenders that they're never beat um, and uh, how to flip up with their inside hand, their shoulder that's closest to the defender, how to flip up instead of swipe down to try to tap that away. And really, yeah. I would say we get probably more steals this way by somebody thinking that they beat us probably than, than almost any other way. No, I think it's a great thing too that, I mean, yeah. we practice the coming from behind thing because it's going to happen if you're pressing, um, but it's that swipe up that they need practice. I mean, they don't practice. I, I don't know. They just don't do that. Nat a lot of them don't do it naturally. There's a few that always do, but no, you can't hold them to it or you can't yell at them for fouling. If you've never showed them the right way to do it without right. fouling. Right. And so, you know, really, that tends to happen with a trap right up here or a trap over here. And so we break out of that a lot and uh, have them. And, it, you know, we I don't have it shown here, but we actually build up. You know, I have an offensive guy and a defensive guy here. We build up to five on five out of this and have, you know, different guys come out of the – off of the sidelines to make it more realistic. And, you know, you can use your imagination for how you would do that. but. If he gets past you, you know, he is going to face another defender pretty soon. And so it's really teaching offensive decision making as well as defensive decision making. And I think, you know, when practice time is limited, you want your drills to cover as many things as possible. Um, implementation ideas, don't try to do all of these or even half of these. Yeah. Uh, Use the off season to plan ahead. Like I said, you probably know your opponents or you should know your opponents well enough to know what top three or four things will work best, will give you the most uh, return on your investment. If you think of it like a debit card, what is gonna give you the most value for the, for the amount of money that you spend? Right. Uh, money being time. And so uh, then number three, script different what ifs every day. Um, if as with offense, you know, we want to get to the point by the end of the year where we're not teaching more plays. We're just teaching them how to play. You want to do the same thing from day one with your defense. And, you know, in football, linemen learn how to pressure effectively. Safeties learn how to make reads. And, you know, I think in this scenario, your linemen are your trappers and your safeties are your interceptors. And I think, you know, if football coaches can do it. I think we can do it with far uh, yeah. few players. I, I think we can too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, going into a game, I think it's a good idea uh, to script the first three possessions and just change your look each time. And so, do you do that on offense and defense? I try to. I don't. I'm not going to say that I always do it, but I do it a lot. And okay. um, again, if you're going to do this, you have to practice it a lot. Yeah. But it does help you know what will be the most effective. 
And like I put here, you, you want to play chess, not checkers. You want to be a couple of moves ahead. And so, especially the second time that you play somebody in a season, you know, you can really get to the point where you're using one of these actions to set up another. And so maybe you're using that read to set up the fact that you're going to go back and squeeze or something like that. Um, number number two, I show you what I talked about there. Uh, and evens, yeah. Yeah, you, how, I, how I've done it. Um, always use one alignment after a free throw. Uh, and so we, we're always in a two to one and we may be in just a regular two to one or we may change a stunt, but a free throw gives you an incredible opportunity to put people where you want them. And it really kind of, I started doing this just because I had a really bad free throw team and I didn't want it to hurt us. And so we were always, we ended up doing really, really well, despite the fact that we didn't shoot the free throw very well. Um, use a different alignment or stunt on other dead ball situations. And then like we talked about, if you can get to the point where you're pressing off of misses that you really, if you can press off misses, you're at a whole different level. Yes. Uh, so John Kimball's where I got a lot of my two, one, two stuff. We talked about Forrest Larson, uh, Vance down was Harrison Barnes, uh, coach there in Iowa. Um, show Walter there in Iowa you know, really good high school coach. Shaka Smart, he was here at Clemson. And then when I was in the D.C. area, he was at VCU. So I've yeah, got a he's lot, got of, lot of great drill stuff, too, I've for, got for the Havoc like, stuff. ton of information from him. Andy Landers, he's now retired, but he was the women's coach there at Georgia and, and coached some really good players. Bob Huggins' box theory is, you know, you want to get the ball to, a, to the side of the court uh, between the free throw lane and the sideline. And once you have it in that box, you want to, you want to shrink that box till you get all the way to the corner. And so, you know, we used to deny passes to the wing and I don't deny passes to the wing. I, I want, I want you, the, ball that's to where we want it. Cause the angles are better at that point to be honest right. with you to trap. Yeah. And so that's why I want, no matter what we're doing, I want the ball to cross half court on the outer third because that puts them in that box from the get-go. And the quicker I have them in that box, the better everybody on my defense can be. And again, if they're, if everybody on my team is on that half of the court, uh, then it's going to look really, really crowded and they're going to try to pass around it or pass over it. And that's what you want. You don't want them to be able to pass through it. So... And then Rick Patino did a black-white press a long time ago when he was at Providence, and he did some of it at Kentucky. But it was, you know, run and trap on the sidelines. And then if the ball went middle, it was run and jump in the middle. And, you know, I haven't seen anybody do that recently, but you know, I've done that a little bit with the run and jump. And that those are these are all people that I've gotten ideas from, and I've kind of combined them into one package and taking what fits me and what I can do easily. So um, again, I, I want to give credit where credit's due and realize that I'm not. What's a, the, what's, but what's the hardest thing to teach on this? Uh, initially, you know, if they haven't been pressing very long, it is how to make those reads and games and, you know, get into that, see it, fix it, see it, fix it uh situation and if you're pressing you're always you're going to quickly see a problem and then you're going to need to fix it and it can't be well coach that wasn't my responsibility when you're pressing like i said you're going to keep going from one job to another really really quickly right um let's go back hey put your screen back up with your um things on i didn't mean to cl close that out um with your context stuff too i just oh, okay. got questions that we can talk to while that screen's up um okay. So um, how much of your practice time do you use to do this? Um, you know, initially. At the go to a high school, go to a high school yeah. coach, not, not you with your players. When yeah. you were coaching high school and you were pressing, how much time did you have to spend in practice on this early, mid, late? So early, I would spend, I would, I would spend, probably spend 75% of practice. And, you know, again, it was what I thought would bring me the most, the, the best return for my money. And, okay. you know, especially being in Atlanta where everybody, a lot of people are playing football 
and when they're coming to basketball, they're not they're not ready to face presses and that kind of stuff. You know, I really looked at at what was going on, and I really started doing that. It helped my my guys be able to face pressure and make make reads really a lot quicker. And they ended up doing a lot of uh, our turnovers in the half court ended up being a lot less, a lot sooner because they were facing a lot of pressure every day. And so you get towards Thanksgiving, you have your whole team and all of that. You know, I start to do a little bit less. You know, at, at Christmas, uh, I'm doing even less. In fact, at Christmas, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to simplify. You know, you're into league play by then. A lot of people have you scouted. You've got enough film to know uh, what has really worked for you and what you need to scrap. And if something hasn't worked by Christmas, then it's not, in my mind, it's not going to work. Right. So stop trying to force it. Just take whatever you're doing well and just get better at what you're doing well. And so by the very fact that you you scrap some stuff, I think simplification, is, you know, really makes you simp- uh, sophisticated, actually, and really difficult if you're just really good at a few things. And I think from Christmas on, you just want to be really good at a few things and just do those things well. So I, I agree. I agree. Um, and how did you land on this kind of press? Uh, you know, I was here, here locally with Oliver Purnell and, and shock on all those guys. And I really started liking that philosophy. Um, then I moved to DC Shaka came and he was at VCU. So I was around his practices really picked up a lot on that. And, you know, then in Atlanta, I was, I was near Andy Landers and picked up a lot of stuff from him. So, uh, you know, I told you that I spent some time in, in Wisconsin and right. I didn't, I never did know Forrest Larson, but I did uh, call him and Eddie Andrus. This was before we even had internet. And right. I, I bugged those guys and they gave me diagrams and stuff like that. They're and, great guys. Um, did do you, um, what made you what made you fall into that freak defense where you after the third you went to man? What what, um, what made you land on that? I love really, that. I've done that in just in college really simply because of the shot clock. And you know, if it if it, it makes, makes the, when you change yeah. like that, it makes a team adjust and there's five seconds to just figure out what you're doing. Right. And you know, even at the college level, there's so many people that just want to run a system and it's all part of the philosophy of breaking your opponent's practice habits. And, you know, nobody is going against this kind of stuff every day. There's just no way that everything that we just talked about a team is working against. And so there might be one thing that they're prepared for and that's fine, but you've got something else that you've been working on and now they've got to do that. And so maybe you pulled off your full court press and some of those stunts, but now you're running your freak defense and there's no, there's really no offense that works against it. You just, you just have to have better players. Right. And, 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 and do you think there is an offense? You talked about like a hybrid dribble drive. Do you think there's an offense that correlates well with the two, two, one, like is compliments it like peanut butter and jelly kind of thing. Yeah. I, you might be familiar with uh, somebody would probably have to be a big hoop head to be familiar with, but Doug Novak is a coach in Minnesota uh, at Bethel, a D3 coach. But he used to be at Tulane and used to be at the Citadel. Uh, he's got a website, CoachDougNovak.com. It's got a ton of free stuff. And he's somebody that I've spent a lot of time with. And I think Coach Lenny A. Cuff had just took over at Lipscomb. Uh, he was at a D2 school at, at University of Alabama, Huntsville. You know, those aren't two famous guys, but I guarantee you, that you can learn more from those guys about offense than, than probably anyone at, at any level. And, you know, I, I bug those guys a lot and they, they both have a two guard front that looks like you're in a dribble drive or a Princeton set, but you know, they're not spending as much time teaching the drop zone and all those things that it takes to get into a dribble drive. You know, it could take a year or two for your guys to learn all that stuff. And they've, they've really simplified it. And so when you're coming down on offense, you know, what you're constantly looking for is for the ball handler to have double gaps to be able to penetrate through. And that is a dribble drive phrase, um, but they've really worked on kind of the next level of dribble drive, which is taking a lot of the dribble out of it and really moving the ball faster with passes. 
And so, we, so does we it have read? Re, does it have read and react principles in it then? Yeah, it it does. If if you're familiar with the read and react, you know some of the some of the rotation principles, like a dribble at, you know, causes everybody to move clockwise, right? And things like that. And so, you're constantly taking away the help defender. And so, you know, again, that's something that just lets your players play. It's it's letting them play out of concepts. You know, we do have set plays that we that we come out of, but you know, a lot of people do set plays and then they just get into their reactionary stuff. We kind of do the opposite. We do our reactionary stuff, and then maybe at the end of the clock, uh, we do a set play. But um, you know, almost everybody at our level at the end of the clock likes to do something off of a pick and roll. <laughs> and, and we're 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 trying to keep the ball moving so fast we never even get to that I, i'm one of the few people i know that doesn't use a lot of on ball screening and i just don't like to bring that other defender to the i don't ball. I, I definitely don't at the high school level i that, yeah. that's one of the reasons i don't do it is i just don't like bringing that defender at him you know right. it's like um if my philosophy is double gaps then i'm totally screwing up my double gaps by bringing somebody up to the ball like that so right I don't want to confuse my players. I don't want to confuse myself. I'm not that bright. So I just want to keep <laughs> and do you, it simple. And do you, and do you, does, does coach Novak call that something or does he just. No, I mean, uh, you know, he just talks about teaching concepts. And so what he's done is uh, really all of their skill work and everything that they do in practice is their offense. And so. I know that's kind of hard to explain yeah. um, and you kind of need to see it, but you know, you can go on his website and you can see the videos and then he's got PDF diagrams, fast, you know, fast model diagrams of, of all his stuff. And you can kind of see what I mean, but they just, they build up from one on one to four on four to five on five every day. And um, it's just a part of, everything is teaching footwork and teaching finishes and that kind of stuff. And they spend very little time actually teaching slides or, or anything like that, that we would consider offense. They just teach you basically how to play off of whoever has the ball. So let's say, let's say, I, let's say he was sitting where you are and I said, Hey, explain your offense. What would he say to me? <laughs> um, he would say it's a, it's, I kind of what I just said, uh, the next version of the dribble drive. You okay. know, we all say that the pass moves quicker than the dribble, but then you know what high school kids, especially if they hear dribble drive, they're going to want to dribble. And so, you know, basically we, we have that one second philosophy. He has that one second philosophy where when you catch it, you're either going to pass it or you're going to shoot it. You know, he doesn't want you to, he wants dribbling to really be your last option. And if you think about that and how quickly the ball moves with that, it takes care of, you know, there's always one player where the, that's ball, what we, we, the, the, the reason I'm asking the question is it sounds like kind of what we ran this year because it was partially read and react, but we also had like, if they're up on you, the dribble and then the rotations, um, because you got to be able to attack on that on that on that dribble. I don't like that. I don't like the low block on the opposite end on the read and react. Yeah. Or the dribble drive. I mean, um, it just. I, I don't think the spacing of that works anymore with the game. The way the games change, I think you got to almost have all five out um, to leave space. So and that's so, interesting. And so what what we do, what he does, is you have the person in that space. But as the actions start to happen, then they it ends up being five out, but it doesn't look like five out. And so when you teach it that way, anybody can be in that base that dunker spot that we talked right. about. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Hey coach, think first of all, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. I hope you like the content. We work really hard to put something out every day for you as a basketball coach. Subscribe, like, hit that little bell. Um, if you're looking to take your coaching to the next level, if you're looking to go from here to here, let me help you do that. Go over and check out teachhoops.com for coaches who want to get better. 30 years plus experience, a lot of state championships. Let me help you go to that next step.